I'm going to review for a few minutes the material that we covered last time on rodents and lagomorphs and then continue on with uh, some of the new material. Uh, so it would be a good thing to go over the material that we've already covered uh, just as a refresher uh, and then to pay attention for uh, the new material. Uh, so we're talking about rodents and lagomorphs and one of the points that we made last time uh, was the following. First of all, that rodents have been enormously successful in an evolutionary sense. Uh, they are present in virtually all um, faunas across the globe, uh, with the exception of Antarctica, and of course as, uh, as global warming, climate change persists, uh, who knows, we may find them in Antarctica as well. Um, so, um, that's a, a somewhat different uh, scenario than what we find with uh, the lagomorphs. The lagomorphs haven't been anywhere near as uh, successful, and that's a little bit unusual uh, when you think about it, because morphologically they are very similar. So there must be something about uh, the differences between rodents and lagomorphs that have resulted in this uh, large disparity in evolutionary success. Um, but the rodents, uh, we divide them up into 34 different families, uh, 350 plus uh, genera, and now somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 species. So it's, uh, it's a quite diverse group. Um, they have this worldwide distribution. They're everywhere. They've, they Even before the advent of man, they were in Australia. Uh, there are some uh, rodents, mirrored rodents, that got to Australia via sweepstakes rafting from Southeast Asia, um, but many of the rodents that are in uh, Australia now were introduced by man. Um, so uh, the morphological diversity within the group is, is uh, considerable, um, and one of the consequences of that is that it's very difficult to figure out some of the evolutionary relationships based on morphology. Um, and of course, uh, genetically, it's perhaps a little bit easier, but again, there's uh, an extreme amount of variation. So I think it's going to be some time before we fully understand what the evolutionary history of the rodents has been. Uh, so as mentioned, lagomorph diversity uh, hasn't been anywhere near as great. Um, there are only 10 genera of lagomorphs uh, and only about 63 species. Um, their distribution uh, is nearly worldwide. Uh, they've been introduced to Australia. They weren't there before man got there. Um, and uh, they were introduced to portions of South America as well. Um, and the question then is, why do we consider them uh, together uh, as rodents and lagomorphs? Uh, and the answer to that is, is that initially they were considered uh, as one single taxonomic unit. Uh, and in fact, the Russians still consider them to be uh, the same. And the reason for that is, uh, as noted by Stu Landry, um, is that if you look at the underside of the skull, you'll notice that the pterygoid processes almost touch the auditory bullae. Uh, there are no other, um, no other mammals that do that, so that's one particular feature. Uh, the other feature is that, of course, that they have a diastema. Uh, the number of incisors are different for rodents and lagomorphs, but then uh, that perhaps isn't all that surprising. There are modifications to the incisors in uh, lagomorphs. Uh, they're not like they are in other mammals, but still um, those are a couple of features. So here you can see on this skull of Anomalurus derbianus, which is uh, Lord Derby's anomalur, um, that the pterygoid processes uh, almost reach all the way back and touch the auditory bullet. Uh And again, the reason you don't see this, or the reason most people don't notice this, is because when you look in museum collections and you pick up rodent skulls, uh, those pterygoid processes are usually broken off, uh, and that happens in the, uh, when skulls are cleaned, uh, especially older specimens before people started using bugs to clean up skulls. People would uh, clean the skulls mechanically with um, some uh, bleach and uh, some ammonium hydroxide and uh, a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. You can uh, prep the skulls, clean them, boil them, uh, and they end up looking uh, very nice, just like this one. Uh, but in the process of picking all this uh, muscle tissue off the skull, uh, those pterygoid processes sometimes get broken off. Now, uh, one thing that you might 
ask is what the heck are the pterygoid processes for anyway. Uh, well, they serve as the point of insertion for the pterygoidus muscles, and the pterygoidus muscles go from the pterygoid processes uh, down to the inside of the dentary bone and attach to the inside of the angular process. Uh, so they're used in adduction of the, of the dentary. Uh, the other thing that's happening there is that the soft palate is supported between those two pterygoid processes. Uh, so you can see right there behind the, the final molar tooth there, uh, there's this gap and the, the hard palate ends. Uh, that hard palate is then replaced by soft tissue, um, the soft palate. So it's making this, uh, this separation between the, the nasal sinus uh, so that the animal can eat and breathe at the same time. And of course that soft tissue is much cheaper uh, to produce than is uh, bone. Alright, so um, it turns out that the two groups may be more closely related than we as, as Western scientists think. The Russians might be right, who knows. Um, but there are those morphological similarities. Okay, when we uh, look at the rodents, uh, we break them up into three groups. Um, and those three groups uh, at one time were uh, formal taxonomic groups. That's no longer the case. Uh, we divide them up into sciuromorph, myomorph, and hystricomorph. Uh, so these are the squirrel-like or the squirrel morphology uh, rodents, the mouse morphology rodents, and the porcupine morphology rodents. And, and those refer those words refer to uh, what's going on with the skull. Um, so now we understand that those those skull shapes uh, really are not good in terms of uh, the taxonomy that we have today. Um, but still, it gives us an idea of uh, some of the morphological uh, shapes that we have in the, in the rodents. And it's a, it's a nice way, if you're at meetings and you're talking about rodents and you start talking about hystricomorph rodents, uh, everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so importantly, when you look, regardless of which uh, group of rodents we're talking about, um, the dental formula, the basic dental formula, uh, is 110021 uh, and then 33. Three. So that means there's one upper incisor and one lower incisor on each side. Uh, there are no canine teeth. Uh, there are two upper premolars and one lower premolar, and then three upper and three lower uh, molars on each side. Uh, the incisors, importantly, are open rooted um, and ever growing, and they occlude with the opposite incisor from uh, the other jaw. And, and when they occlude, uh, they serve to grind away at the posterior margin of those teeth uh, so that those incisors are uh, sharp all of the time. Uh, just as an interesting side note, a uh, number of years ago, one of the um, dentists in town, uh, and I won't say who it is or who it was, um, called me up on the phone and told me that he had a... Uh, a miniature um, mastodon skull in his possession and he wanted to show it to me. Uh, and I asked him how big this, this skull was and he said, oh, it's, it's only about uh, an inch and a half, two inches long. And I said, well, it's unlikely to be a mastodon, but I'll, I'll look at it. Uh, so he brought it and it wasn't a mastodon at all, it was a marmot. And uh, the incisors, one of the upper incisors, did not occlude correctly with the lower incisor. And as a result, that upper incisor grew continuously because the lower incisor was never shaving off the posterior margin. Uh, and this incisor continued to grow, and of course they're, they are curved teeth, so it grew in this nice arc until ultimately it penetrated the palate and then uh, up into the rostrum. And, and it got to the point where the marmot could no longer close its mouth, and at that point the animal starved to death. Uh, and that's how um, he happened to come across the, the carcass or the skull. Um, so the occlusion of those, uh, inclusion of those incisors is important, and the consequence is that they have these very sharp teeth all of the time. Uh, so here you can uh, see what that looks like, what those open-rooted open -rooted teeth look like. Uh, in the dentary bone, you see that that root continues all the way past the masseteric fossa. Uh, and for the upper incisor, it makes this nice arch uh, that goes all the way across the um, premaxilla. 
so that's one important thing. Uh, the other important thing to think about here is what the forces are that are operating on those teeth. So as these animals close their jaws uh, and those teeth come into contact, or in the case of a beaver as those teeth are gnawing on a piece of wood, uh, if you look at this you might think that uh, most of the forces are going to be shear forces uh, that are being applied to those teeth. And that turns out not to be the case. Uh, there's this very nice paper by a woman in Germany working on European beavers um, where she analyzed uh, the forces and, and uh, stresses and strains that were being applied to those teeth. Um, and she noted that there are these little micro ligaments that hold the teeth in place, uh, much like the sort of configuration that you have uh, if you've ever, if, as a female, you've ever worn um, this item uh, of clothing called Spanx that sort of maintain your form or shape your, your body into some sort of perceived ideal form. Uh, so these micro ligaments um, are actually very elastic and as the forces are applied to these teeth, the teeth are pushed back into their, uh, into their roots and then those micro ligaments tighten up and hold these teeth in place. Uh, so it turns out that the forces that are tolerated by these teeth are not um, shear forces, but instead compressive forces, and that compression is then uh, absorbed by those uh, micro ligaments. Uh, the other thing to notice when you're looking at this skull is what's going on with this suture line that is between uh, the maxillary bone and the premaxillary, and you'll notice how it curves. Uh, so first it goes up and then it curves back. You don't see that in um, all mammals. You see it in animals that are exerting a lot of bite force on those incisors. Uh, so there are not very many mammals where that, uh, that suture line uh, arches over like that. Uh, and it shows up in, in animals that are applying a lot of force to those, uh, to those upper incisors, as is the case in beavers. Um, so what ends up happening is the longer that that suture line is, uh, the more strength you can have in that, uh, in that fusion that occurs between those uh, two bones. Uh, you can think of it sort of as a weld. If you have two pieces of steel and you just tack weld them together at one point, that connection isn't very strong. Uh, but if you lay down this nice continuous bead uh, over the full length of the piece of steel, uh, that connection is going to be much stronger. Uh, so the more length you can get on this suture, uh, the more strength you have. Uh, and that's what's, what's going on here. So they curve the, the animal curves that suture line around, uh, in, increasing the total strength that you have in that, um, in that connection. All right, uh, the next thing to pay attention to, and that again is regards of whether we're talking about, say, your morph, myomorph, or hystricomorph, is what's going on with the teeth. Uh, now, we've not spent a lot of time uh, talking about teeth. Um, we've not worried about naming all the cusps and, and all of that. And uh, it's a good thing to know. It's very difficult to learn. Um, and there are relatively few people that, uh, that work on teeth, and one of the reasons for that is, is because it is, um, it is a significant challenge. If you're ever working in a museum environment uh, as a systematist or taxonomist or something of that sort, um, it's an important tool to have under your belt. Uh, but when you look at these teeth, uh, they are clearly highly derived from that basic tribosphenic tooth model that, that we looked at earlier uh, in the semester. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice is uh, the cusps on these teeth are difficult to interpret, oftentimes because the pulp cavities are open. So the surface of the tooth is not covered with enamel as it is in yours, um, but the, the top of the tooth is worn away, uh, and you have these loafs and ridges and things of that sort uh, with the exposed pulp cavity. Uh, and you can see that uh, here, if you look at this diagram, there are a number of different uh, varieties of teeth that you can see in rodents. Uh, we've already looked at these ones. Uh, the important thing is that these different tooth morphologies tend to be associated with different kinds of diets. Uh, so if you understand what's going on with the teeth, then you know quite a bit about uh, what's going on with the diet of that animal. Um, so who cares, aside from a taxonomist or a systematist? Uh, well, uh, it turns out that most of the fossil mammals that we have are 
simple individual teeth. And that's true for almost, not all, but certainly a large portion of the rodent fossils that we have are just based on a single tooth. Uh, so just looking at that tooth, uh, you can understand a great deal about what the diet of that particular uh, animal would have been. So it does have uh, ecological relevance as well if you're trying to understand the evolutionary history of a group. Okay, um, so uh, a couple of other things to think about, um, and that relates to the lower jaw. Uh, recall that when we're talking about uh, carnivores, in particular when we're talking about uh, cats, uh, animals that have uh, carnassial teeth uh, those teeth, when they come together, they must occlude exactly, just like in a pair of scissors. If a pair of scissors is supposed to work well, um, the two blades of the scissors have to occlude, come together in a very precise fashion. Uh, so what you see in a carnivore, a hypercarnivore at least, is that there is virtually no lateral movement in that lower jaw. Uh, the dentary bone comes up and down, and that's it. There's no lateral movement. That's very different in rodents and, and lagomorphs. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that the glenoid fossa, that mandibular fossa that um, uh, articulates with the dentary bone, is open. So instead of being this nice C shape, it's a very shallow kind of a shape. And the result of that is, is that that mandibular condyle is able to, to shift around in that fossa and you get a lot of movement in that dentary bone. So if you've ever had a pet hamster, uh, you've noticed how that hamster is almost able to move that dentary bone in sort of a circular fashion. Uh, and they do that so that they can grind the cellulose in the food that they're consuming. So the two dentary bones are moving independently of one another uh, and essentially allowing the animal to use those lower incisors as a pair of tweezers. Uh, so it's a very clever little trick. and. Uh, what that means then is that the uh, dentary symphysis, that band of ligamentous tissue that, that holds the two dentary bones together at the front of the jaw, uh, is elastic, uh, much as the pubic symphysis in human females is elastic as well, so that when they go through childbirth, um, the two uh, halves of the, pector of the pelvic girdle are able to separate a little bit because the uh, that connective tissue that unites the pubic symphysis dissolves away and the two halves of the, of the um, pelvic girdle are uh, mobile. They're able to separate just a bit. All right, um, now back to uh, the um, jaw. The masseter muscle, uh, which is in rodents the primary group of muscles that is going to close the jaw, uh, is divided into three groups. Um, Unlike in carnivores, where the muscle that was involved in closing the jaw was the temporalis muscle, uh, here we have three masseter muscles that are, that are operating on that um, dentary bone. And what that means then, if you have three muscles, they have different origins and insertions, uh, and they can all go off in different angles. And because of that fact, when they're operating that lower jaw, they're able to move it in all kinds of different directions. Uh, so they have a great, uh, much greater uh, amount of uh, mobility in that lower jaw than you would find in a carnivore. All right, so uh, let's look at uh, that uh, specialization within the, the um, skull. Uh, here again, we're talking about sciuromorph, myomorph, and hystricomorph. Um, and let's think about this in terms of uh, what's happening with those masseter muscles. Um, so the first one is this protogomorph. Uh, that's proto means first and morph is shape. Uh, so these are the animals with the first shape, sort of the sort of basic uh, rodent sort of jaw morphology. Uh, we really don't have any animals that we classify as protogomorph, but uh, in the fossil record we do, but no extant forms, uh, perhaps with the possible exception of something like um, mountain beavers. Uh, so sayuromorph, that's the squirrel shape, myomorph is the mouse shape, and hystricomorph is the porcupine shape. Uh, and you see what those diagrams look like here um, 
if you if you look at uh, the arrows, which are the arrows for the uh, directions of the masseter muscles, uh, the one at the top is the protogomorph. Uh, and there you can see that the masseter muscles are simply going from the denary bone up to the zygomatic arch. Uh, by the time you get to the sciuromorph, uh, that one masseter muscle is now moving up along the side of the rostrum, so no longer attaching to the zygomatic arch, but instead going up to the rostrum. Uh, and there's this groove right in front of the orbit that that muscle fits in, and you can actually take your finger and lay it in that groove if it's something like a marmot skull. It's a, it's a pretty nice kind of a groove. Uh, why would you do that? Well, recall that um, the amount of power that a muscle can generate is a function of cross-sectional area and length. Uh, so the longer the muscle, the more powerful the muscle is going to be. So one thing that's happened here is the muscle is now much longer than it was initially, and the result then is that the jaw is more powerful. Um, below that is the myomorph uh, model, and they too have increased the length of uh, one of the master muscles. But here, that, um, that interior master, mu master muscle goes underneath the eye and then goes through the infraorbital foramen, uh, and then uh, has its origin uh, on the side of the rostrum. So now this muscle is, is considerably longer as well. Uh, and then in the hystricomorph model, it's a little bit like the myomorph, with the exception that uh, that infraorbital foramen is now absolutely huge, which means, of course, uh, that the size of the muscle that's going through there can be quite large as well. Uh, so the way you tell the difference between a myomorph skull and a hystricomorph skull is by looking at the size of that infraorbital foramen. Uh, in the hystricomorphs it's absolutely huge and in the mouse morphology guys it's, it's considerably smaller. And here's simply a diagram illustrating uh, what the master muscles look like in that regard. They've also uh, included the temporalis muscles in here, but recall in rodents the, the key muscle that's important in closing the jaw is going to be uh, the masseter series. Uh, so here's a myomorph. This is uh, Sigmodon hispidus. Um, and I, I know Sigmodon hispidus, uh, that's the cotton rat. It's a rat. It's not a mouse. I understand that. Uh, but it is myomorph. So when we talk about uh, chryseted rodents, for example, or murid rodents, we're talking about rats and mice. We call it myomorph, but we really mean, I mean, a rat is just in essence, a large mouse, and that's all. Um, so, um, uh, let's look at some of these. Uh, there is some controversy about all of these, um, and that shows up with something like the anomalurids, which uh, the anomalurids have been classified either uh, as sciuromorphous and or hystricomorphous, depending on who the author is. Um, and it turns out that myomorphs could be, in an evolutionary sense, could be derived either from hystricomorphous forms or from sciuromorphous forms. And, and it's partially for this reason that we no longer use these uh, terms in a taxonomic context. Uh, the anomalurids, uh, it's not surprising that the anomalurids would be so, um, so controversial um, because it's a relatively small group. So there are only um, six species of anomalurids. Um, they're, they're restricted to equatorial Africa. Most of them are in equatorial West Africa. Um, and it's not exactly clear who their closest evolutionary relative is. Uh, one hypothesis is that it's another very limited group, a monotypic group. Um, that's the spring hair, which is uh, in the family Pedididae. And in that entire family, there's just the one species, and that's it. Uh, so it's a group that we don't understand evolutionarily very well, uh, and it's especially interesting, at least from my perspective, because of the anomalurids, um, most of the forms, with the exception of one, is a glider. So there's only one of the anomalurids that does not glide. All right, so um, those different skull morphologies represent solutions to um, herbivory, at least on a very small scale. So I think understanding those morphologies helps you understand the relationship between uh, form and function, and that, I think, is why it's important to understand that stuff. All right, so um, the sciuromorphs, um, that seems to be the least derived of, of the three morphologies. 
um, and uh, there, there isn't really any specialization with regard to uh, connections that are associated with the, the masseter muscles. Basically, it's just going up to the um, up to the zygomatic arch a little bit in front of the zygomatic arch, and that's it. Um, a good example of that would be Aplodontia or Sciurus. Aplodontia is the mountain beaver, and Aplodontia is the one that is oftentimes uh, considered to be a protogomorph. Um, the families that we include within the, the, the Sciuromorphs are the Aplodontids, those are the mountain beavers, um, the Sciurids, the squirrels, uh, and that includes the tree squirrels and the ground squirrels, uh, so chipmunks and um, uh, and uh, gray squirrels and fox squirrels and red squirrels and marmots, right? So groundhogs, whistle pigs, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the geomyids, which are the gophers, um, the heteromyids, and I, I understand that uh, in southeast Missouri you're not going to be familiar with gophers. If you're in southwest Missouri, uh, you're right there on the edge of gopher habitat. Um, gophers are different from moles. Uh, when gophers, they, they both tunnel underground. Uh, moles, when they have an opening that comes up to the, to the surface, uh, the opening is surrounded on all sides by dirt. When a gopher comes up to the surface, all the dirt is on one side of the opening. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between a gopher hole and a mole hole. Um, at any rate, the gophers are a big deal out west, not so much here on in the Midwest or on the e in the East, uh, heteromyids are the um, are the kangaroo rats and kangaroo mice. So it includes all of the uh, pocket mice and all of the uh, kangaroo rats. A uh, very cool group of rodents. We talked a little bit about them last time with regards to the fact that uh, the kangaroo rats, at least, are water independent. Um, they're called kangaroo rats because they have really long tails and really large hind feet, and they're saltatorial, so they're, they're hoppers. Um, the castorids are the, the beavers. Um, anomalurids are the scaly-tailed flying squirrels, which are not squirrels at all, although they are sayormorphous. The petitids, which are the spring hares um, from South Africa, just one, one family, one, uh, one genus, one species, that's it. All right, I'm going to skip through most of this uh, material here, other than for Aplodontia to note this sort of interesting uh, cheek tooth morphology that we already pointed out, and we'll see that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to skip through all of this. We've already talked about this at some extent. Uh, let's now look at some of the families within the Hystricomorphs. All right, so let's go over uh, who all of these families within the Hystricomorphs are. Uh, the Hystricidae are the Old World porcupines, and the Arethozontidae are the New World porcupines. Um, the Caveids um, are the uh, Patagonian hares, or the Cavies. Uh, the Hydrocarids are the Capybaras. You can see those guys at the St. Louis Zoo. They're popular zoo animals, uh, regardless of whether you're in the, in the U.S. or in Europe. Um, they're oftentimes in European zoos. They run around free across the entire uh, zoo grounds. Uh, the Dinomyids are the Pacaranas, uh, which you're not going to be familiar with. Um, the Heptaxodontids are an extinct group of West Indian uh, rodents. Uh, there were three groups within that family. Uh, the Dasyproctidae um, are the Agoutis and the Pacas, and we'll talk a little bit about those in a few minutes because they have these uh, really bizarre uh, zygomatic arches. Uh, the chinchillas, another South American uh, rodent, um, uh, are oftentimes used uh, or ranched uh, in, the, in the U.S. for their pelts. Um, it's fashionable amongst the well-heeled and wealthy to wear chinchilla coats. Um, and in fact, when I was a, a kid, um, I had ties to a chinchilla ranch and uh, was involved in caring for chinchillas. They're very cool animals, and they're popular in the pet trade as well. Um, the Capromyids are the nutrias, and of course we have nutrias now in uh, in Missouri. We talked about those a little bit last time, uh, as to how they were introduced uh, from South America into North America um, in an effort to uh, bolster the fur trade. Uh, 
Uh, they were sold as beaver pelts to the French, and apparently the French were unable to tell the difference. Um, uh, the Tinomayids are, are the Tuco Tucos. Um, the Octodontids are the Octodons. Uh, the um, uh, the Abracomidae are the Chinchilla rats. Uh, the Echomyidae are the Spiny rats. Um, the Thrion, uh, the Thrino, I'm sorry. The Thrionomyidae, um, those are the cane rats. Uh, the Teromyidae are the uh, Dazzy rats. Uh, the Batharigids are the African mole rats, including the naked mole rat, uh, which if you've ever uh, been to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., they have this absolutely wonderful display of um, the naked mole rats. Um, these are the guys that... Uh, they, they have them set up in these clear plastic tubes, and you can watch them running around in these clear plastic tubes. They're absolutely naked. The, the pelt is almost non-existent. Um, and the cool thing about them is that, that they are eusocial, uh, so the, this very extreme, port of, extreme sort of social structure. Uh, and then they also um, are narcoleptic, so they will be running along and then suddenly they stop and fall asleep and for a number of minutes they just lay there sleeping and then they just magically get up and continue on with uh, what they were doing. Uh, and then the tenodactylids, which are the gundis, and I will show you a video clip of gundis um, a little bit later, or on the web page. All right, let's look at the families of myomorph rodents. Uh, the first one at the very top, the Chrysetids, those are the guys that you are most familiar with. Um, those are the, the New World rats and mice, so that would include the wood rats and the Atoma, uh, plus all the little paramiscus um, and Rhythrodonomies, those the harvest mice and the, the deer mice and the white-footed mice that you are probably most familiar with. Um, Going down that list a little bit, uh, the murids, those are the old world uh, rats and mice. Uh, so Norway rats, black rats, uh, uh, house mice, mus musculus, the guy if you have a barn that's all over your barn, or the guy that you generally gets into your house if, uh, if you live out in the country. Um, they came over with Christopher Columbus and with uh, all the other explorers. Uh, the uh, glirids are the door mice. Um, and the cel uh, Selaviniidae uh, are the desert door mice. Uh, so those are old world uh, mice. Um, oftentimes they have very fat tails. Uh, they use the tails sometimes for energy storage. Uh, the Sapodids uh, are the jumping mice. Um, so Zapus and Nepiozapus. Uh, they are, uh, Zapus is, Zapus hudsonicus is a species that we have right here in Missouri. Um, I've never caught them in Missouri. I've caught many, many, many in the Black Hills uh, in South Dakota, but never here. Although they are, they are abundant at Duck Creek and Mingo, and uh, Scott Ellis from uh, Truman used to catch hordes of them uh, down at Duck Creek. Uh, and then the Depotids are the Jerboas, so another group of jumping uh, rodents. All right, so uh, here you can compare the skulls uh, of two myomorphous rodents, um, Neotoma on the left and Tatera, which is a gerbil, on the right. And uh, if you are interested in functional morphology um, and you want to understand why animals have the particular shapes that they do, um, looking at the dentary bone is a very good place to start. And you can see that here by the rather unusual uh, feature of the gerbil on the right. Uh, notice how um, how far forward that masseteric fossa goes, and notice the almost complete absence of the uh, cornide process. So clearly the uh, temporalis muscle isn't doing much on this particular animal. Uh, if you look at the neotoma, the wood rat on the left, clearly the angular process is much more extensive. Um, so it's a, it's a cool thing to think about uh, and explore if you're interested in form and function. All right, uh, we're going to skip all of that stuff other than to uh, just sort of draw your attention to uh, sort of the development through evolutionary time of the rodent morphology. And you see that all the way from this mammal-like uh, reptile from the Jurassic, this therapsid at the top that has this nice diastema. Um, and then by the time you get to this uh, multi-tuberculate from the Paleocene, uh, you notice there is not only a significant diastema, but also this large uh, procumbent lower incisor. 
Uh, and this sort of weird thing that's going on with the premolar on the bottom, uh, this comb-like tooth, uh, you see that in, in uh, colugos, right? But you also see it in a lot of marsupial, small marsupial mice. Um, they have these bizarre sort of premolars that are, look almost exactly like that. So that would be another interesting thing to explore uh, if you ever decided to do a, a PhD or something of that sort. Uh, and then Paramis uh, down from the bottom, which is uh, an extinct uh, rodent, but a good rodent. Uh, and you can see it, it looks very modern, okay, with, with perhaps the exception of the brain case. It, it looks like a good modern kind of rodent. All right, uh, we're going to skip all of that, um, and uh, I'm going to skip all of that. Uh, I'm going to skip all of the um, all of that. Um, but now let's uh, consider um, a couple of things. Let's talk just a little bit about uh, about foraging or about um, uh, herbivore diets in rodents, and then also talk about uh, locomotion. Uh, so if we want to understand the evolution of rodents, then we need to think about both locomotion and diet. And just keep in mind that um, if you want to understand biology, it all comes down to this very simple equation, right? Uh, calories in and babies out. Uh, the reason locomotion is important is because it helps you find where the calories, or it helps get you to where the calories are. Uh, and of course, uh, diet is important because it's what enables you to get the calories in uh, to produce the babies. Um, but most rodents are, are herbivorous, but uh, if you dive in a little bit deeper, you'll realize that many of them are insectivorous. Uh, some of them are um, eating fish, some of them are specializing on reptiles, birds, uh, other mammals. Uh, and a good example of that here in, uh, in the U.S. would be the grasshopper mice that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, so you should look at videos of grasshopper mice. I will find a video and, and post one on the web page. So grasshopper mice. Uh, they do these cool ultrasonic vocalizations. Uh, they stand up on their back legs and they just absolutely scream. It's, it's really cool. Um, uh, they do have a very distinct odor. They're really fluffy and they have really short tails. Uh, they will take bird eggs, they will eat lizards, uh, uh, they will eat baby snakes, they will eat other mammals, they're, they're really cool. Um, for locomotor styles, uh, there are animals that are quadrupedal, which would include uh, a lot of paramiscus. Um, arboreal, which would also include, include paramiscus. Fossorial, so animals that are burrowing underground, so that would be things like gophers and, and uh, things of that sort. Um, saltatorial, the animals that are hopping around, and then semi-aquatic. Uh, some forms are able to, to swim. Think of beaver, right, and nutrias. They are semi-aquatic. Um, all right, um, we can continue all of this on and, and uh, look a little, do a slightly deeper dive on the jaw morphology. Um, so we've talked about skull morphology, cyromorph, hystricomorph, and, um, and uh, myomorph. Uh, we can divide all rodents up into two groups based on the jaw morphology, and that is Sayurignathus and Hystricignathus. So the squirrel jaw forms and the porcupine jaw forms. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we come up with this nice little uh, diagram here. Uh, a diagram A is a look down right on the top of a Sayurignathus dentary bone, while B is a look straight down on a hystricognathus um, dentary bone. And then C and D are cyognathus and hystricognathus as well, but just uh, from a slightly different angle. And you can see right away that the difference between cyognathus and, and hystricognathus is what's going on with the angular process. Uh, in the hystricognathus forms, that angular process is flared out to the sides. And clearly, uh, what that does is that provides a great deal more surface area for insertion of the masseter muscles. Uh, so you can imagine that those animals with hystricognathus jaws are going to be much better at um, generating high bite forces than will something like uh, a gray squirrel. Uh, so here's a, an extreme form of that. This is uh, for the nutria and this is truly a bizarre uh, kind of a jaw. Um, it, it does have this really unusual shape 
the coronoid process uh, indicated by CP is just this micro uh, little structure there. It's just uh, vestigial. There's essentially nothing left of it. Uh, notice that that lower incisor, the the, um, uh, the fossa for that lower incisor is just almost straight down uh, right across the front of the dentary bone. And notice this constriction in the, hor in the horizontal ramus. Uh, and then how far back and flared out that angular process goes. So uh, it is really kind of an extreme uh, dentary uh, morphology. It would, it would be a lot of fun to explore the biomechanics of, of, that, um, of that jaw. All right, so uh, let's look at who the Cyurignaths are. Uh, those would be the mountain beavers, so Aplodontia. Um, we talked about them before. Um, all of the Cyurids, so all 50 genera and 273 species of uh, both flying squirrels, tree squirrels, and ground squirrels. Um, here's what uh, Aplodontia looks like. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, and we'll look at those teeth in just a few moments here as well. The, the weird thing about Aplodontia uh, are these little flanges that occur on the sides of the teeth. It's the only mammal that does that. Uh, there, looking down at the top of the skull, you can see the external auditory meatus projecting out from the side of the skull. Um, so the the notice the the um, zygomatic arches are really far out to the sides, uh, and of course what that's going to do is as those zygomatic arches are out to the sides, uh, that also serves to increase the length of the um, of the masseter muscles and results in these increased bite forces too. Alright, so there, uh, looking at those uh, cheek teeth, uh, premolars and molars, and you see those extreme flanges going out to the sides of those teeth. That's uh, only mammal that does that. And here too, you can see that the top of the tooth is eroded away. And what you're seeing in the middle there, that dark region, that's the pulp cavity. So enamel on the extreme outer surfaces, the very hard stuff, then the slightly yellower stuff on the inside of that is going to be the um, it's going to be the uh, the dentine, and then inside of that is the living pulp cavity. So uh, imagine what that would be like to walk around all day with uh, a cavity in each and every tooth. It seems it would be uncomfortable. It would be curious to understand exactly what rodents do to um, to solve that particular problem. Um, and then uh, as well, when you when you look at um, the teeth of something like Aplodontia on the left, and then Dipodomys, uh, Merriam's kangaroo rat on the right, uh, you see this very consistent pattern. So this hard outer edge and this softer bit on the inside. And of course what Dipodomys is, it's a seed specialist, so it's, it's eating seeds of desert plants um, to, to the exclusion of essentially everything else. And uh, it makes you wonder what Aplodontia is doing, so it would seem to suggest that they're using those teeth in similar um, in similar fashions. All right, um, so here on the left we have uh, Paramis, which is this uh, Paleocene uh, rodent, and then Aplodontia on the right, and you can see the similarities in those um, in those skulls. Uh, looking at uh, the diversity that you see see within the Cyurids, uh, it is extreme. These are um, these illustrations here are from uh, John Eisenberg's uh, work on neotropical mammals. Um, so he has a wonderful two-volume set on neotropical mammals. It used to be in Kent Library. I'm sure that uh, it has long since ended up in a dumpster somewhere. Uh, Kent Library isn't particularly good about hanging on to books. A new book comes in, an old one goes out, which is truly unfortunate. Um, but these illustrations are just absolutely glorious, and it just shows the, the extreme diversity that you find in uh, even just the color patterns of uh, New World squirrels. Uh, here are more examples. Uh, so we have gray squirrels, fox squirrels, red squirrels, and then lots of chipmunks and things of that sort, and western gray squirrels. Uh, we have some diversity. Uh, the Europeans have uh, re have uh, Cyrus vulgaris, which is also called a red squirrel, but is fundamentally different from our red squirrel. It's a different genus. Um, but when you get into South America, you see this extreme sort of color morphology uh, in the tree squirrels, and that's really cool. Of course, there are other uh, arboreal mammals there. This is a, um, a didelphid, so uh, not a, it's not a squirrel at all. It's a it's a marsupial. 
there's a lot of color variation and morphological variation with these animals too. All right, so uh, let's now look at the geomyids. These are the gophers. There are five genera and 35 species, um, and they're both North American and Central American. Uh, and they are morphologically convergent with talpids and notorictids, so the marsupial uh, moles and then the insectivore moles, right? Uh, what's interesting about the geomyids is that they have external cheek, cheek pouches, uh, just as kangaroo rats have external cheek pouches. Um, and uh, th that's an important point. So if you've ever had a kangaroo rat as a pet, and I recognize that you haven't, uh, perhaps you had a, a hamster as a pet at some time. Hamsters have cheek pouches too. Their cheek pouches are internal. Uh, so if you have ever had a hamster as a pet and you feed it sunflower seeds or whatever you like to give yours, um, they will take it, put it in their mouth, and then jam it into these pouches that they have in their cheeks. And their cheeks will get absolutely stuffed full of, of sunflower seeds or whatever you're giving them. Uh, kangaroo rats do that as well, but their cheek pouches are on the outside. So when they pick up something, it doesn't go into the mouth. It just goes into this upside down pocket on either side of their, on either side of their face. The nice thing about that, uh, from, an, from a scientist's point of view, if you're ever working on kangaroo rats, is when you trap kangaroo rats, you can very easily figure out what they've been foraging for by you hold the animal in your hand and you just take your little finger and just pull everything out of their cheek pouches and you get this nice sample of what the available seeds are that they've been harvesting. Now it turns out that just because they've harvested it doesn't mean that they eat it. Uh, what kangaroo rats do when they uh, pick up these seeds is they'll go back to the safety of their burrow and once inside their burrow they'll empty everything out of their cheek pouches and then sort through it and keep the stuff they like and eat that and then discard everything else. Uh, much like when you're a little kid and you go trick-or-treating, you get this bag, giant bag full of candy and whatnot. You go back home at the end of the day and you sort everything out and there's stuff that you want and stuff that you give to your little brother or something like that that you don't want. Okay. Uh, so, um, these geomyids, uh, the, the pocket gophers, have these pouches as well and they too stuff them out, uh, stuff them full of, of uh, plant material and then they will sort through it later on too. So uh, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, and then of course they're, the openings to their mounds are different from what you see in moles. In moles the opening is at the center of the mound and in pocket gophers the, the opening is at the bottom of the mound. Heteromides are the, the kangaroo rats and kangaroo mice and pocket mice. There are six genera and 59 species. Um, they're primarily uh, desert species, so the southwestern U.S., uh, Mexico, Central America, and in South America as well. Uh, they are saltatorial. Um, Perignathus and Ketodippus are um, quadrupedal, and, and Perignathus and Ketodippus have a very mouse shape rather than a rat shape. Uh, and, of course, the cool thing about kangaroo rats, and we talked about that last time, there are a couple of cool things. Um, one is that the auditory and auditory is misspelled there, um, but the auditory bullae are absolutely huge, making up half or more of the skull. So they, those auditory bullae act as resonating chambers. And uh, what kangaroo rats are able to do is they, because they have these gigantic resonating chambers in their ears, and because their burrows act as resonating chambers, uh, they can hear a snake fart at a thousand yards. It's, it's quite spectacular. It's very difficult to sneak up on a kangaroo rat. Um, I'm going to post uh, videos um, of uh, kangaroo rats. Um, there are a couple of cool ones out there on YouTube illustrating how kangaroo rats are able to uh, avoid predation by snakes by, by jumping. Um, and that's pretty fantastic to watch. Just the, the shapes of these animals are, are really awesome. They're a wonderful animal to work with. Um, just as an aside, uh, for a number of years, I've been uh, doing consulting work for a uh, land development company out in California. Um, they want to build, uh, develop 40 acres of land, and they want to put a large number of houses. They're putting 11.2 houses per acre on these 40 acres. And the land that they want to use is uh, perfect habitat 
that is currently occupied by the San Bernardino kangaroo rat, uh, which is a subspecies of uh, Dipodomys merriami. Uh, there are only 3,000 acres of habitat for the, Merriam's can uh, for the San Bernardino kangaroo rat left. Um, so what I've been doing with this company is determining how many kangaroo rats are on their property uh, and they are trying to restore other property um, into kangaroo rat habitat so that they can take these 40 acres and then create 40 acres elsewhere that will be suitable for the kangaroo rats. Um, but it's, uh, it's an interesting project to work on uh, and it involves a lot of uh, occupancy analyses and things of that sort. Um, but the amount of money that is spent by this development company in sort of rehabilitating habitat for the San Bernardino kangaroo is enormous. I mean, it is in the many millions of dollars. Uh, and you think that that wouldn't make any financial sense, except that these 11.2 houses per acre in California, uh, each house will sell for somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to two million dollars. So it's, it's just absolutely crazy out there. Um, but uh, the other interesting thing about kangaroo rats, and we talked about that somewhat earlier, is that the loops of Henley are radically long. Uh, and as a consequence, they're able to concentrate their urine to an incredible degree. Uh, and they are able to persist on metabolic water so they can spend their entire lives without ever drinking water. They can, um, they can persist on metabolic water. And they also have the ability to drink seawater um, in captivity, if you give them water, they become addicted to water. So it's it's like meth or something like that, or oxycontin for these guys. They once they get it, that salt um, concentration gradient within the kidneys breaks down, and from that point on, they are absolutely dependent on water. Uh, here you can see what those uh, auditory bullae look like. Uh, the shaded region represents the auditory bullae on the bottom. Uh, so a large portion of the skull is, um, is auditory bullae. Uh, this is the skull of uh, the banner tail kangaroo rat, so Dipodomys spectabilis, um, and you see how large those auditory bullae are. All right, um, they uh, are saltatorial, um, and so if you're hopping around, uh, there are other animals that do that as well, things like gerboas uh, and spring hares. Uh, and then kangaroo rats. And if you look at the hind feet, and this doesn't show up well on this illustration, it's cut off on the right there. Um, but uh, one of the things that happens is the hind feet are really long. Uh, and uh, it turns out that what that really is, is that the toes are fused and then the toes are really long. Um, so they each do it in a slightly different way, but they have these long feet. And of course, we've talked about uh, speed of locomotion and how you can achieve that. And there are really two ways. One is to increase the stride rate and the other is to increase the stride length. Uh, so by having really long feet, uh, you are able to increase stride length in that way. And that's exactly what horses and, uh, and other ungulates do as well. Um, in terms of what's going on with the cervical vertebra, just as in cetaceans where you don't want your neck flopping around to the side, uh, cetaceans uh, um, compress all of the cervical vertebra uh, so that there's no neck mobility. Uh, and what happens in uh, saltatorial rodents like uh, kangaroo rats and gerboas and, and spring hares, um, they fuse the cervical vertebra together so they have no neck mobility. If a, if a kangaroo rat wants to look over its shoulder, it can't do that. It has to turn around um, to see what's behind it, but there is no neck mobility. And that's a clear advantage if you're hopping around uh, you want to maintain a consistent center of mass, and if your head's flopping around, that's not going to happen. And, of course, you don't want neck injuries, too, if your head's flopping around while you're hopping. Uh, so here's a, a pocket mouse, um, uh, Lyomis, so different from Perignathus, but the skull shape is essentially the same. So the, those are the pocket mice. And then there's this weird group, um, the kangaroo mice, uh, these are the microdipoda, this is the genus Microdipodops, uh, and there you can see that the size of the, um, uh, the auditory bullet is even more extreme than it is in uh, the kangaroo rats. So these are the kangaroo mice. Um, so Microdipodops is in the Great Basin, gets all the way up into northern Utah. Uh, it's a very, very, very 
awesome, awesome mouse to, to catch. Uh, they're fun to work with and they're, they're just a true glory to see when they're running around in the deserts. Again, you can see how large those auditory bullae are. Fully half the skull is auditory bullae. Alright, um, so now let's uh, look at uh, the castoids. These are the, um, uh, the beavers. There are only two species of, uh, within the castoridae. Uh, our North American beaver, which is Castor canadensis, and then uh, the European beaver, which is Castor fiber. Um, they have castor glands, uh, so they use to mark their territories. Uh, they have flattened tails uh, to aid in swimming. Uh, and they have a very uh, thick, dense uh, pelage uh, for insulation, so even when they're in the water. They've got webbed feet and valvular nostrils and uh, nictitating membranes as well, so they can uh, close the nictitating membrane but keep the eyes open and see underwater at the same time. Um, and then, so there's, a, there's um, a dorsal view of the skull of a beaver, there's the ventral view. Uh, notice again, those uh, uh, pterygoid processes go all the way back and essentially touch <coughs> um, the auditory bullet. Uh, there are the teeth, um, this nice folding pattern, so it's all about their ability to, to chew up vegetation. And if you look at what a beaver is capable of doing, I mean, they just chew down on these um, these trees, they just gnaw around the periphery of the tree until finally the tree comes down. And of course, what they're doing is they're, they're environmental engineers. They're making dams. They'll find some stream somewhere and then make these dams uh, to generate these large pools of water. And their den is going to be inside the dam in a nice dry place, but the only way you can get into it is by going underwater. Uh, out west uh, in New Mexico, there a lot of the farmers in New Mexico, especially in the Rio Grande Valley, have problems with beaver, and they spend a lot of time blowing up beaver dams in an effort to um, maintain uh, their ability to irrigate their fields. Uh, there are, if you've ever been to um, uh, uh, Blue Hole, which is the largest sinkhole pond in Missouri that's out there, uh, on the Castor River, I think. Uh, it's a very cool area. There's a gigantic pond there. It's insanely deep and there are beaver all over that thing. It's a fun place to be. All right, uh, the Pedidids uh, are the spring hares. Um, it's a monotypic group, uh, so it's only the spring hares, uh, the one Pedidis capensis, the only, the only one in the group. Uh, they're Hystricomorphus and Cyurgnathus, um, and as are the Anomalurids. Uh, they are thought by some to be the group that's ancestral to the anomalurids. Uh, they're highly saltatorial. Uh, they look a lot like rabbits, jackrabbits with very short ears. Um, very, very, very cool group. The skulls are, are really bizarre to look at. Okay, I don't think I have an illustration of a skull, but um, they, are, they are interesting looking skulls. And then, of course, the anomalurids, which in my view are the absolute coolest rodents on the planet. Uh, they are gliding. Uh, they're divided up into a couple of groups, three groups I guess you could say. Uh, there are the larger anomalers, that's the Anomalurus derbianus, which is Lord Derby's anomaler. Anomalurus, Anomalurus beecrofti, um, pusillus, and then pelli. Uh, those are the big guys. Um, then there are two very small anomalers, Anomalers, uh, Idiurus macrotus and Idiurus zenkeri. These guys are uh, 20 grams or less, so they're mouse size. Uh, and then there's this weird one, Zancarella insignis. Uh, Zancarella insignis is the only one in the group that doesn't glide. Uh, so there are six, seven species in the group. Uh, four of them are gliders, one of them does not glide. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about what the uh, phylogenetic relationship of Zancarella is to the others. Uh, so, uh, the reason that's important is this, if Zancarella is ancestral, uh, that would then argue that all of the other anomalers uh, develop gliding independently or evolved the ability to glide uh, from Zancarella. On the other hand, if Zancarella is not ancestral and perhaps an one of the other anomalers is ancestral, that would then indicate that Zancarella had the ability to glide and then lost it. Uh, 
there's a woman in, in Germany that's been working on that question for a very long time, and she has just published some work recently, uh, as has uh, the, one of the um, paleo people from the University of Kansas, um, just published work uh, making the argument that Zancarella is ancestral to the others, uh, so that somewhere after that break-off, um, Anomalurus and Idiurus evolved from Zancarella, they developed the ability to, to glide. And of course, the question then is, uh, is that gliding, um, uh, did it evolve once or did it evolve two times? Now, there is one uh, interesting thing about um, these animals, and that is this. I guess I don't have another illustration of that. Um, I'll have to rely on this illustration. Uh, one of the things about um, both Idiurus and uh, Anomalurus, if you look at the base of the tail on this animal, you'll see these overlapping scales. Uh, that's why they're called the scaly-tailed uh, flying squirrels. Uh, and when they land on a tree, um, that tail is slapped down against the side of the tree and makes this uh, very audible, you know, clapping kind of a sound. Uh, the other interesting thing is uh, the way they support the flight membrane, the potassium. Uh, in our, our flying squirrels, in glaucomies, uh, there is this little cartilage that stinks out from the wrist called the um, styliform cartilage, and that supports the wingtip. In anomalurs, there is also a cartilage that sticks out, but it doesn't stick out from the wrist. It sticks out from the elbow, uh, and it's referred to as the uncaform cartilage. Uh, so, anomalurs are sometimes referred to as the elbow gliders rather than the wrist gliders like our glaucomies. So, when these animals are gliding, uh, the hands aren't stretched out to the sides. Instead, the hands are held in close to the chest, as you see on this animal, and the elbow is held out to the sides, and then that uncaformed cartilage sticks out past the elbow to support the wingtip. So, it's just a fundamentally different way to glide. Um, when you look at the teeth of, anom of anomalurs, it almost looks like the, the, the same sort of teeth that we saw in, uh, in the mountain beavers, with the exception of here that they're, uh, it's not just one hard edge around the sides, but you have these uh, loaves on the inside. But it's the same kind of a, same kind of a um, pattern. And you see that not only in anomalurus, but you see that in idiurus as well. Uh, so here's the skull, the, the ventral view of the skull. Uh, that's, uh, both of those are anomalurus, and here you see what the teeth look like for idiurus. So it's the same basic pattern, although idiurus is considerably smaller than anomalurus. So whereas the big anomalurus are getting close to a kilo, uh, you know, anywhere from 600 grams up to 1,000 grams, uh, idiurus is down around 25 grams, so they're tiny little guys. And here you see the skull for idiurus. Just these tiny little things. All right. Um, these are the, the Gundis. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I have a video clip of Gundis that I will show you. Make a note of that. I had to go all the way to Finland to see uh, Gundis in, in a zoo setting. Um, they look a little bit like pikas, but uh, they're clearly not. Um, they're uh, semi-arid uh, from Africa. Um, they, the cool thing about um, Gundis is that uh, they're highly social, um, and they, there are a lot of interactions that take place between um, uh, the, mater or the, the females and the offspring. Uh, the sort of distribution of mammary glands is sort of odd. They have these uh, axillary mammae, and they also have uh, a pair on the anterior thorax. So, um, you, you can imagine if, um, you know, if um, it's, it, there is no, it's not like you have a, a milk line. In most mammals, there's this milk line, which goes basically uh, from the thorax down to the inguinal region, and all of the um, uh, the nipples are going to be on that milk line. Here it's kind of weird because you have one pair which is axillary and then you have another pair that would be on that milk line. All right, um, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, the murid rodents, um, uh, the old world rodents, um, uh, 
I, gu I guess the taxonomy of, of murids has changed. A lot of things that were formerly included in the Chrysididae, the New World rats and mice, are now included within the Old World rats and mice. Um, but at any rate, there are lots and lots and lots of subfamilies and lots and lots and lots of species of murids. Uh, so within the murids, um, the families include uh, the Chrysidids, which are the New World rats and mice, uh, the Rhizomyids, which are the bamboo rats, um, the spiny door mice, the Old World rats and mice, and then the mole rats. And we're just going to skip through that. That just shows you the uh, diversity of dental forms that you can have in, in rodents. And just to make the point that all those hypocones and protocones and hypoconulids and protoconulids and metaconulids and metacones and all of that, it's all there. Uh, it's just very difficult to interp interpret because of the folding of these teeth. All right, um, looking at two murid rodents, uh, compare these skulls. And again, from a functional point of view, just ask yourself, why would you have this sort of extreme uh, difference in skull shape? It's something that's worthy of exploring, I think. On the left is a rock mouse, uh, and on the right is a shrew rat. So two very different approaches. The one on the right has this extremely long rostrum, and you can imagine that the nasal epithelium is going to be extensive, so a sense of smell ought to be very good. Uh, and on the rock mouse, that's not going to be the case. All right, let's skip through all of these guys. Um, the depotids uh, are jumping mice and gerboas, uh, includes uh, Zapus and Napiozapus, uh, ricocheted locomotion in Zapus, um, and gerboas are saltatorial. Um, so ricocheted means you ricochet, right? That's pretty clear. Um, gerboas have elongated loops of Henle, just like dipodomies. Um, and interestingly, with uh, gerboas, is they're capable of hibernation. Uh, and they can hibernate for up to nine months at a time, which is uh, sort of an interesting. All right, I'm going to skip through all of these guys. Uh, Napiozapus. Um, so uh, we have, in this country, we have Zapus and Napiozapus. Um, they're both jumping mice, uh, different genera, but um, the same basic body form. Uh, let's see, who do we want to include here? Okay, I think we're going to... Oh, oh, oh! Um, on, the, on the left uh, is a mole rat. On the right is a beaver. Uh, you can see, uh, first off, some of the similarities, but you also notice the extreme difference, uh, especially with regards to the angular process. Um, and uh, here's the skull of an African crested porcupine. We do have an African crested porcupine in the collection. Um, I have a video of, uh, of a crested porcupine that I'll show you. Make a note of that. Okay. Uh, and one question to ask yourself when you're looking at this skull is why would the rostrum be inflated like that? It's sort of an interesting thing to ponder. Um, and I think the answer, you'll find the answer if you start thinking about the mechanics of, um, of applying those bite forces to the front. So you'll notice the suture line for the, um, for the premaxilla and the maxilla. The premax maxilla suture is, is fused, uh, but you can see where the maxilla goes all the way up to the top there. Um, so if you're thinking about bite forces, uh, most of what's going to happen on this guy is going to be compressive forces. And any shear forces that would be involved at the front of the rostrum, uh, there's a lot of material to try to shear through. So my guess is, and it's just a guess, is that what's happening here uh, is this animal is able to tolerate extreme bite forces just as a consequence of the, uh, the large surface area that would have to be sheared in order to break that front part of the skull off. All right, so um, New World Porcupines. Uh, one cool thing about uh, New World porcupines is that the, the quills on these guys uh, have one-way barbs. Um, and uh, if you've ever had a dog that's encountered a porcupine, uh, you know what a mess it can be because 
what the one-way barb means that uh, if your dog gets a barb in its in its mouth or on the side of its face or something like that, the only way it's coming out is by being pushed all the way through. Um, it you're not going to pull it back out without damaging an awful lot of tissue. Um, porcupines are awesome. Uh, they are in northern in northern latitudes. Uh, if you're ever out west, up in the the northern Rockies or um, in Yellowstone or something of that sort, even Tower Rock in, in Wyoming, you can see evidence for porcupines everywhere. They gnaw on the sides of uh, ponderosa pine trees, so they leave these big scars on the sides of ponderosa pines. All right, uh, I'm going to skip through almost all of that. Um, oh, one group that I want to talk about are the agoutis, um, the pacas, uh, and I just want to point out that um, when you look at these guys, they have uh, these really weird zygomatic arches. And I think I have an illustration of that coming up here. There we go. Um, there's a, a paca. Um, that's what the zygomatic arch looks like. And you have to ask yourself, what in the hell is going on with that? Uh, it turns out that that whole area there is inflated. So there are all these sinuses on the inside of that. Uh, and the leading hypothesis is that these animals are using those sinuses to modify the sounds that they're producing. Uh, so we don't know very much about vocalizations in pacas. Uh, it's a South American species, um, so down in Patagonia and all of that. Um, it would be cool to be able to get at those vocalizations, uh, capture some of those vocalizations, and even have some specimens to uh, to look at to sort of explore the um, using finite element analysis, trying to explore what the mechanics of that dentary bone is going to be, because clearly it's an odd-shaped dentary bone, uh, and you wonder about what sort of forces are being applied there, and, and the suspicion is that perhaps not much. Um, when I was a graduate student in California, uh, we had um, somehow, and I don't know how, uh, but we obtained an agouti paca, um, and uh, James Dale Smith uh, skinned and stuffed the animal, uh, and it went into the collection, and then the carcass was there. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do when I took mammalogy was that we could take carcasses and clean them up, uh, and then articulate them for display purposes. Uh, and uh, there was a woman in the class that was working on this agudipaka, and it's a time-consuming process. Uh, so she had put the animal in, in alcohol for a number of days and then transferred it to water and, uh, and let it soak for 24 hours in water and then added some ammonium hydroxide and a little bit of bleach and a little bit of biz um, to the mix and boiled it. Uh, and for an animal this size, you generally need to boil it about a half an hour or something like that. And she was having a hard time bringing the water to boil, so she decided to go off and get some dinner or something while she was working on this. And uh, I guess her dinner went a little bit long because she came back about three hours later, and of course this animal had been boiling in this ammonium hydroxide and and uh, a solution for about two and a half hours. Uh, and when she tried to pull it out of the um, out of the pot, uh, everything had dissolved. So all the skull, everything had just was just this fine powder on the base of the on the base of the pot. Um, and James Dale Smith was not a particularly friendly, warm and fuzzy kind of a guy. He just went absolutely ballistic. It was, it was quite, quite the spectacle. Um, it was unfortunate loss of a specimen, uh, not an easy specimen to get, and he was rightfully upset. Um, but boy, what a mess! All right, um, let's skip through most of this material. Okay, uh, we've talked about nutrias uh, already. Um, we can skip past that. Let's now switch over and talk about um, uh, lepords and okotonids. Um, so these are the, the rabbits, rabbits, hares, and pikas. Uh, and the first thing to note, uh, remember that this group has had much less evolutionary success than have the rodents. Um, the interesting thing about um, 
about them is that they have these peg-shaped um, incisors immediately behind the upper incisors. So the dental formula, they have two upper incisors rather than one, which is what you see in the, in the rodents. And also, uh, for the molars, uh, the number of premolars is more variable, and the number of molars is more variable. So the number of teeth can be anywhere from 26 to 28, rather than the 22 that you find in, in rodents. Interestingly enough, embryonically, there's a third pair of incisors lateral to the uppers, but that one never shows up uh, other than in the embryo. Um, and the cheek teeth and the molars are open-rooted and grow continuously throughout life, and that clearly is an adaptation to uh, dealing with a food substance that is highly um, abrasive. Uh, in Laporids, uh, the rostrum is fenestrated, so if you look at the side of the rostrum, there are all these little openings, it's like windows, right? Um, and what the function of that is, is, is not exactly clear, although it's probably involved somehow in sensory perception. Uh, one consequence of that is that that rostrum is relatively weak, uh, which means that it's possible to catch a, uh, a rabbit, a cottontail, uh, with a little mouse trap. And I've caught many rabbits with mouse traps. You set traps out for mice. They're obviously small traps, and when the mouse comes and grabs the bait, it comes down and snaps him right behind the head. Um, if a cottontail comes up and licks the bait, it comes down and snaps him right across the front of the face, and because that rostrum is fenestrated, it will actually crush that rostrum, and you now have a, a rabbit in your mousetrap. Um, there is this superorbital process on the frontal, um, and uh, which is a unique characteristic. And then uh, the other interesting thing is, if you're trying to understand the difference between uh, rabbits and hares, uh, rabbits have a cotton ball tail, um, whereas hares have a longer tail. There are also differences in the nest that they make and so on, but um, it's the tail which is the, um, the best description uh, for the difference between the two. Uh, so here, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see two things. Both uh, You can see the fenestrated rostrum, uh, indicated with the arrows. Uh, and then you can also see these little peg-like incisors, which are right behind the front incisors. Only, only um, Laporte's, or only um, Lagomorphs do that. Um, here's a, a jackrabbit um, on the left and an arctic hare on the right. Okay. Uh, what's the function of that little peg-like incisor? Uh, Presumably, it's uh, to aid in, in snapping off or cutting off the vegetation. All right, so they, um, they are saltatorial. Um, so they, they are, uh, they are um, hoppers. And a little bit more about that in a few moments. There are some adaptations they have uh, that are kind of unique. Uh, unlike uh, rodents, they have a duplex uterus. Uh, so they have a cloaca and a duplex uterus. Um, which is unlike the rodents. And unlike rodents, they do not have a baculum. Uh, so all rodents have a baculum, this os penis. Uh, lagomorphs don't do that. Now, uh, one of the things that's going to happen if you're hopping, um, especially for rabbits, uh, they oftentimes uh, make rapid changes in direction. They're obviously using uh, saltatorial locomotion as a predator avoidance uh, strategy. And uh, if you've, for example, if you've ever been out in the desert and you've seen jackrabbits, um, if you spotlight a jackrabbit and the jackrabbit runs away, what it'll do is it'll take the tail and flag the tail, alerting you to exactly where it is. And then it changes directions left, right, left, right, left, right. Uh, and if you've ever watched a coyote trying to run down a jackrabbit, the coyote focuses on that tail and makes the similar turns left, right, left, right, left, right until ultimately the jackrabbit will drop the tail and then no longer make the turn and just go off straight. And of course the coyote has been conditioned to go left, right, left, right, left, right, and suddenly the jackrabbit doesn't do that, and the coyote misses a beat, and then the jackrabbit gets away. So if you're going to change directions like that, you have to make sure that your joints, your elbows and your, your knees aren't blowing out in when you change those directions. Uh, and what the jack and what rabbits do, particularly in jackrabbits, 
uh, if you look at diagram number B, um, the illustration in the middle, uh, the electron process has this little um, tooth that comes up. So when that elbow is extended, this tooth actually goes through a hole that's within the electron fossa and sticks like a peg. So it's basically locking the elbow into place. So that joint becomes absolutely stiff and rigid and there's going to be no lateral movement in that joint. So because they're changing directions so drastically, that locks it into place and they no longer have to, to worry about blowing that elbow out. All right, um, we're going to skip through all of that other than to note that uh, historically they were much more diverse than they are today. Uh, so while the rodents have had enormous um, increase in diversity with time, uh, it's been the opposite for um, lagomorphs. All right, so I said that uh, the, the lagomorphs, there are really two groups, uh, the leporids, uh, which are the rabbits and hares, and then the ocotonids, which are the pikas. Uh, and pikas are um, found both in Asia, in China, and in, uh, and in North America, in the, in the mountain west. Um, they occupy primarily talus slopes. Um, so at one time, they were relatively abundant throughout the Great Basin, and they occurred all the way up to Alaska, but something has obviously happened, and that's no longer the case. Um, they are uh, highly territorial, um, so they're living amongst all the rocks in these talus slopes. They're highly territorial, um, and they vocalize. They give off alarm calls, these high-frequency, high-pitched calls to indicate presence of predators or danger or something of that sort. So they're about the size of a gundi or a, a chinchilla, something like that. Um, and they have rounded ears rather than the long ears that you find in rabbits and hares. Uh, very soft pelage. They, you, if you didn't know better, you wouldn't think that they were um, lagomorphs, but in fact they are. Um, they make hay for the winter. Um, I'm going to come back to their distribution here in just a moment. But they make hay for the winter. Uh, here's not a very good photograph, but here you can see what a pika looks like. Uh, and what the pikas are going to do, it's on its rock slope, and it's going to spend the entire spring and the entire summer harvesting and making hay for the, the winter. And it's going to grab all this vegetation and stockpile it in its little den and build up this nice, very thick den for the winter. And when winter comes around, two things are going to happen. Obviously, there's no longer anything for it to eat outside. It's going to stay within its den. And as that vegetation that it's stockpiled, this hay that it's stockpiled for the winter, begins to decay, it's going to give off heat. And the pika is relying on that heat to keep it warm. The other thing is it's saving all of that hay for something to consume throughout the winter months. So it's not hibernating, it's going to persist throughout the winter, but it's going to be consuming that hay and relying on the hay, decomposition of the hay for uh, overwinter survival. Now, uh, the problem for pikas is that they're dependent on these talus slopes. Uh, so you find these talus slopes in the mountains and uh, these guys are temperature sensitive, so they cannot tolerate high temperatures. And what's happened with climate change, obviously, is that average temperatures have increased fractions of a degree, a degree, you know, something like that. So the available thermal habitats that are available for pikas are moving upslope. So uh, populations of pikas that were once down at lower elevations have started to move up, 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 higher up the slopes. And the problem for the pikas is that they're running out of talus. So the higher up you go, the fewer talus slopes there are, and a lot of pika populations have disappeared just within the last 20 years simply because thermally they've run out of habitat. Um, we typically associate pikas with, uh, for example, if you've ever been in Teton uh, National Park there, just south of Yellowstone, uh, there's a nice population of pikas there up at uh, you know, north of uh, Lake Jenny there and on Inspiration Point. You climb, you go up some of those little valleys, there will be pikas up in there. Uh, but also at the other end of the Yellowstone caldera uh, over in Idaho at uh, Craters of the Moon National Park, 
It's a lava field, and inside that lava field is a population of pikas. It's totally unexpected, but there they are, and somehow they're able to hang on. Um, if you look at uh, pikas, one of the things that you notice um, is that the incisors, and, and they, like Laporte's, have these peg-like teeth as well, um, but the, these incisors are grooved down the anterior surface, um, and they're notched, as in, in uh, figure A. So they're notched, and what that means is that they're using those to manipulate um, these food items and to cut this hay. There is another um, animal that has grooved incisors like that, and that's a species that we have right here in Missouri. Um, it's a little harvest mouse, so Rhythrodonomies. Uh, we have, I think it's Rhythrodonomies megalotus, uh, the western harvest mouse. Um, it too has those grooved incisors, and it too uh, harvests hay, quote unquote hay, in the same way that um, uh, in the same way that pikas do. Uh, here too, you notice that the the um, rostrum is fenestrated, just as in the lagomorphs. Uh, you'll notice that the molars have a slightly different shape, but it's still that fenestrated skull. Um, if you look at um, differences between uh, rabbits and hares, uh, rabbits have a diploid number of 42 chromosomes, whereas hares have 48 chromosomes. Um, rabbits build fur-lined nests and give birth to altricial young. Hares make shallow depressions and give birth to precocial young. Uh, in other words, their young are furred, have open eyes, and are fully formed and ready to go. Um, rabbits have an interparietal bone, but hares do not. So between the two parietals, there's going to be a small bone. You see that in rabbits, but you don't see that in hares. Um, rabbits, or lepords, oftentimes have color coat dimorphism. So think of um, snowshoe hares, which are... Um, um, uh, Lepords, uh, their coat color changes from from uh, summer to, to winter, um, and they have induced ovulation and high reproductive uh, capacity. So reproductive output on Lepords can be extreme. All right, um, that's it uh, for rodents and lagomorphs. Uh, there are yet uh, a couple more lectures coming. Uh, coming up, and those are going to be more technique lectures. Um, I'll have those available uh, as soon as I have them ready. Um, watch for links on the webpage. There is going to be, um, there will be videos on gundies and um, grasshopper mice and kangaroo rats and uh, a couple of other things as well. So look for those videos. Um, take care, uh, and I'll see you guys next time.